I want to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Seth Shostak. Uh, some months ago, I saw him on uh, the National Geographic channel, and I thought to myself, self, why don't you uh, just reach out and see if he would be interested in speaking to us? And he very uh, kindly responded very quickly and uh, agreed to it. Uh, and here he is. Uh, Dr. Shostak uh, received an undergraduate degree in physics from Princeton and a doctorate in astronomy from the California, from Caltech. And for much of his career, he conducted radio astronomy research on galaxies and is the author of a number of books and uh, published approximately 60 papers in professional journals. He's currently the senior astronomer at the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California, coming to us from there, I believe and the director of the Institute Center for SETI Research. And he is going to be talking to us tonight about the search for intelligent life in the cosmos. And I'm excited, I'm sure everybody else is very pleased. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Shostak to our meeting tonight and thank, uh, thank him very kindly for agreeing to speak to all of us. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. I hope you're getting the audio here, although if you're not, it's not really gonna- getting- I'm getting it fine. I think we're, you're coming through good. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about SETI. Um, I had originally prepared for a three-hour talk, but Steve told me they can only be two hours. Okay, so looking for intelligence in the cosmos. I should point out this is slightly different than just looking for life in the cosmos. The Perseverance rover on Mars is in some sense looking for life, but not intelligent life. And uh, it's certainly going to be the case when people say, well, do you think we'll find intelligent life first or stupid life first? And uh, I usually answer with the latter because a stupid life seems to be far more prevalent than intelligent life, at least here in California. The, uh, the, the facts are that there are a lot of worlds, there are like seven worlds in our solar system that could support stupid life, microbes, stuff like that. Uh, there's only one that we think can support intelligent life, namely you all. So. Uh, just keep that in mind. Why do we think they're out there? This is a question I occasionally get at cocktail parties. It's usually the last question, but we only think they're out there on the basis of statistics because we have not found any life in space, any. And uh, that includes, by the way, microbes dead or alive. So there have been claims, but there ha- hasn't been any really good evidence. But of course, there. this is the 10 to the 22 uh, number of stars in the visible universe. That's a lot. We now know that virtually all these stars have planets. And not all those planets are bad ones either. I mean, most are in our own solar system. You know, uh, we have, I know, eight or nine planets depending on your predilections, but only one is really good for intelligent life, right? So, you know, that, that cuts the number down a bit, but even so, it certainly pays to look because the number of planets in our galaxy that could have intelligent life is a very large number. We'll get back to that. Now, the first modern attempt to try and find ET actually isn't so far back in time. It was 1960, and uh, many of you know this story, I think. This is the 85-foot antenna at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in lovely Greenbank, West Virginia. Uh, and this, this is an old telescope. This was, in fact, the first telescope that was constructed at the NRAO there in uh, Green Bank, which by the way, is about three hours west of Charlottesville, Virginia, for those of you who know where that is, and roughly three hours from Washington DC as well, which has something to do with the fact that this site was selected for the observatory because it was close enough to the funders to make it uh, intriguing for them to go visit. Anyhow, this antenna was used by Frank Drake here, and uh, Frank Drake actually still works in SETI, even though this first experiment was done back in 1960. He used this antenna for about two weeks trying to eavesdrop on aliens. All right, now Frank is 90 uh, 90 years old now, but he's still very much involved with SETI and the SETI Institute. In fact, we're having an event at the SETI Institute in about a week's time uh, called the Drake Award, and we will honor various people who've made contributions to SETI. Frank uh, did this experiment He did not find the aliens. He pointed the antenna at two nearby stars, uh, Epsilon Eridini and Tau Ceti. Those were the two that he pointed at. Actually, one of them is known to have planets, but not back in 1960. He didn't hear anything. He actually did hear something, 
it was probably a military uh, radar, and that didn't count as aliens. Okay, but that established the scheme used for all SETI experiments since that time. Even today, the majority of the SETI projects around the world, and there aren't very, aren't very many, they're, they're all in California when you come to uh, <laughs> think of it. They're, they're all here. I, I don't know what happened. Uh, but in any case, they all have the same approach as Frank had in 1960. He used this equipment. This is the receiving equipment there in uh, West Virginia that he used. This is the only photo, by the way, that was made during the entire project. He called it Project Ozma because it was looking for something wonderful far away and that sort of thing. But he was very cognizant of the fact that this was considered by most mainstream astronomers as being kind of a, a long shot and maybe a silly one at that. So he made a point of not spending very much money. By using all this equipment, which was already there, right, he could minimize the cost. The whole experiment ran for something like $2,000. And, uh, you know, that doesn't buy you much science today. So that's what he did. A couple of weeks listening. That generated so much interest that uh, there was a conference the next year. And ever since, people have basically been doing the same thing. This is how we do it today, at least at the SETI Institute. This is a, an array of antennas. And uh, although there's a dime in this uh, photo for scale, in case you can't see it, let me just point out that the antennas here are six meters in diameter, so like 20 feet. Okay. There are 42 of them. The idea was to build 350, but uh, unfortunately, the R&D cost more than was expected, so we only had money for 42. If any of you has you know, won the uh, Rhode Island lottery recently and want to give some money to improve this instrument, you could do so. Obviously, we would enjoy that. Now, uh, I, I should point out that, you know, it's 42 antennas, all right, that, you know, sounds like a lot, and it is, but it's not as big as some of the larger telescopes in the world. So sensitivity is not a forte of this particular instrument. However, because it's, you know, the SETI Institute's own instrument, we can use as, as much as we want. We get all the telescope time we can possibly want. This is the receiver today, by the way. The receiver used by Frank Drake was just a Halicrafters uh, commercial radio receiver, and uh, the frequency was changed on that by just a piece of string tied to a, a motor that uh, just turned the knob back and forth. But uh, so he had one channel that he was listening at. Now, that's the problem, you know, you don't know where on the radio dial the aliens might be transmitting because they didn't send any emails saying, oh, well, uh, we'll, we'll be at 1435 megahertz on the dial. But we had an idea, or he had an idea, that he should look in the vicinity of the well-known neutral hydrogen line, which uh, pervades the universe, because the universe, after all, is three quarters hydrogen. And all that hydrogen sitting between the stars produces this natural uh, radio noise at about 1420 megahertz. So knowing that, we figured this would be marked on everybody's radio dial, even the Klingons, uh, sort of like the old Connell Rad triangles that used to be on radio dials. In case of a nuclear attack, you could turn in the news and get top 40. Okay, so most experiments have looked around the 1420 megahertz line. Where do we point the antennas? Well, this is the conventional approach, the same one as Frank. You know, we want to point them at, uh, you know, worlds that might be somewhat like the Earth, because we know that a, a world like the Earth can cook up intelligence. So we're looking for things like liquid oceans, chemicals, energy, time, all those things. Time just means that they're, they're reasonably old, at least a couple of billion years old, because otherwise maybe there hasn't been enough time for biology to develop into intelligence. So this is all very conventional, conservative, and completely understandable. <laughs> Earth has lots of cousins, yes. This is a recent result from analyzing Kepler data, by the way. Uh, and that is that, you know, the first thing that's happened is we found out that planets are as common as cheap motels here in California. Almost all stars have planets, okay? Uh, what wasn't known, and still really isn't known, is what fraction of those planets are, you know, kind of rocky planets, roughly the size of Earth, so that they could have oceans, and you know, an atmosphere and all the sorts of things you think that sophisticated life forms must have. And the latest estimate, this is a paper about a month or two ago, 
say that that's between one half and a third of all sun-like stars. Sun-like stars, as you all know, uh, constitute roughly 8% of all stars. So, you know, that, that means that they're on the order of, I don't know, 40 billion of them in, in the galaxy. And half of those may have a planet that could potentially have intelligent beings on it. So that's a lot of, a lot of uh, Earths, if you will, in our galaxy, you know, on the order of 50 to 100 billion. Now, presumably most of them don't have intelligent life, although it's hard to even say that. But with a number so big as that, you know, you have to say, well, I mean, it's not unreasonable to expect that there's somebody out there at least as clever as we are. That's all that SETI goes from because we don't have any other evidence. I mean, you know, the biggest science news story of 1996 was the, the claim that a, a meteorite found in Antarctica actually had fossilized Martians in it. But, uh, you know, that's very controversial. There's no really conclusive evidence of any kind of life, as I said, let alone intelligent life. But the numbers are certainly, well, they're attractive and they're encouraging here. However, even though many, many SETI experiments have been conducted since 1960, we haven't heard anything. It's been an awkward silence. And how do you explain that? Well, here's some of the usual explanations. Explanation one is there just aren't any aliens out there. And, uh, you know, there are people who will say that, but not many people actually. Uh, polls that have been conducted since the 1960s, in fact, show that roughly 80% of Americans think that, uh, you know, there, there are aliens out there, uh, although the government is keeping that news from you. I have to also point out that one third of Americans, and by the way, one third of uh, Europeans and people in Japan, China, anywhere, one third of them believe that the aliens are here, buzzing the skies and, you know, hauling people out of their homes from uh, Situate, which I thought was in Massachusetts. But anyhow, so that's one possibility that there aren't any aliens, but that doesn't seem very likely. It could be that they're hiding, you know, maybe they feel it's, it's dangerous to transmit anything. I can hardly believe they're all hiding, however, and certainly not from us. Uh, maybe we just haven't looked in enough places. Maybe the experiment hasn't run long enough. I think that that's the expl explanation myself, but you could say I have a, a hound in that fight. And the other thing is, do we have enough sensitivity to pick them up anyhow? Well, that's a legitimate thing. And in fact, I'm going to elaborate on that just a little bit, just to show you how, whoops, hold on. Okay, you, you can see this graphic down here. This is a simple graphic that I made on a semi-log plot. Keep that in mind. This is just the size of the largest antennas around, just to give you some idea of how quickly sensitivity to finding ET is improving. And it's on the order of a couple of orders of magnitude per century. So the experiments are getting better, but it's slow. It's definitely slow. All right, now here's a number I've got to throw at you because if you're going to a cocktail party next weekend, you might want to try uh, flogging this number. This is the typical sensitivity of radio SETI. And uh, it's 10 to the minus 23 to minus 25 watts per meter square per hertz. Those are the units that are used for this. In other words, well, that's a pretty sensitive number, actually. I mean, that's, that's very high sensitivity. It's said that all the energy collected by all the radio astronomers since 1930s, when radio astronomy was essentially invented, all of that energy combined is less than the energy of an ant flexing one leg. All right. So this is one thing you can say for radio technology. I know you guys are using optical. But radio technology is extremely sensitive, extremely sensitive, okay? And it's also in some ways easier than optical, but there you go. That typical sensitivity, that if you translate that, if you kind of work that number backwards, then that means that if there's some aliens out there at say 200 light years away, that's the power, 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 15 watts, that they would need to muster if they're gonna broadcast in all directions so that we get the signal, okay? Now that's a lot of power. You may wonder why 200 light years, only because, you know, if you take a sphere around the earth at 200 light years radius, it has about a million stars in there. So, you know, if you think, okay, one, one star system in a million has an intelligent civilization, then this is the kind of energy expenditure 
they have to make in order for us to be able to hear them. Now, 10 to the 13, 10 to the 15, actually, it applies to all SETI experiments. Yes, some are, you know, 20 times more sensitive than others, depending on how big the antenna is, and so forth and so on. But it's, you know, within two orders of magnitude, it applies to all of them. That's tens of millions, even a billion times as much power as the Arecibo radar had, and it was a uh, pretty powerful radar, uh, two, two megawatts, and a huge reflector. I don't know if any of you have been down to Arecibo to look at this, and if you haven't, you should kick yourself, because it's going to be a little harder now that they're taking it away. But this, uh, this is a thousand foot diameter uh, antenna, and so it could take those one or two megawatts and concentrate them into a tiny, tiny spot on the sky, right? At most frequencies, it would be like three minutes of arc, right? So that's, what is it? That's one one hundredth of the area of the full moon, okay? Even the unfull moon. So, you know, asking this much of the aliens is maybe asking a lot. It's more than the total power used by Homo sapiens. You know, all the cars, the planes, the trains, the power plants, the, you know, the video games, all of that, add it all together. And this demand on the aliens that they have a transmitter that's at that, you know, 10 to the 15, 10 to the 17 watts is asking a lot of them, okay? And it might be too expensive, even for aliens. Now, the reason this, is, this requirement exists, of course, is because we only invented radio about 100 years ago, right? And, uh, you know, maybe the aliens invented radio 100,000 years ago or even 100 million, it's possible. And they expect that we have a much more sensitive setup than we actually do. So maybe that's why we're not picking anything up. And that's, that, uh, you know, that's a tough, tough thing to beat, except for the fact that you can say, well, wait a minute. We've been talking this whole entire time, or at least I have, uh, about omnidirectional broadcasts. But why do that? I mean, maybe they're just trying to get in touch and unload their used cars here on Earth, and they built a big array of antennas, and they're focusing, they're beaming signals toward us. And if you have a big enough array, you can make the beam as small as you want, right? It's just a fraction limited. And at radio waves, that isn't the problem, it is at optical. So, you know, if they have some array like this, they could easily ping us with the amount of power that, you know, is required to run the headlights on your car, okay? But if you assume that maybe that's what they're doing, then you have to ask, well, wait a minute, why are they beaming anything to Earth? Now, here's kind of a 3D plot, uh, you know, just to show what our local stellar neighborhood looks like, right? What would encourage them to beam anything toward our solar system? Well, you know, you could say maybe they don't like uh, <laughs> our approach to I don't know, climate change or nuclear war, any of these things, right? There's a lot of, there are a lot of articles suggesting that we haven't heard from the aliens because they just think we're not living the good life by their definition. Well, I think that's all baloney, but you know, you, you could make that argument. But even so, if you make that argument, you have to point out to yourself that the aliens don't know about any of that. They don't know about any of it because they can't be more than about 35 light years away and have had enough time to A, pick up our earliest television broadcasts, which were essentially right at the end of the Second World War, to pick up our television broadcasts and to send a reply back to Earth saying, you know, more howdy doody or whatever, right? So that limits the amount of the cosmos that could be interested and responding to any activities by Homo sapiens to essentially 35 light years, this number of stars. Well, that isn't a very large number of stars, obviously. So it seems extremely unlikely to me that anybody knows we're here other than other residents of Earth. And uh, that's kind of disappointing for those of you who hope to be abducted by the aliens uh, as a step toward improving your, your social life. They don't know about us yet. Now, they will know that there's life here because, you know, they can do spectroscopy uh, on the atmosphere of the Earth. And you can see, you know, Venus, the, the spec that's the spectrum of, of uh, the light bounced off the clouds of Venus. And you can see there's some lines there due to carbon dioxide. Mars, also carbon dioxide, not much else. But Earth has 
O3, which is, or sorry, O2 down there. So oxygen and also water vapor. And those are giveaways that there's life on Earth, uh, particularly the oxygen. You know, 21% of the air in your living room there is oxygen. And uh, you might wonder, well, where did that come from? Well, it didn't come from the Big Bang. It, it came from photosynthesis, right? Uh, so, you know, if they could see an absorption line of oxygen from the Earth, they would know, oh, well, Zork, there's obviously life there because there's photosynthesis. So maybe we ought to send a, a message to that planet and talk to the cabbage or something else that does photosynthesis. Yeah, maybe. That, that signal has been going out for 2 billion years. So maybe people know that there's oxygen in our atmosphere. But is that enough to broadcast signals to us? I mean, do you want to talk to the grass? Well, there are only two cases there you have to think about. If biology is a very common thing, I mean, if a lot of plants have biology, then we're just another entry on a list in the back pages of some astronomy textbook, right? We're very commonplace. If biology is rare, then on average, they're going to be very, very far away. So maybe we're not a priority. So what's lacking here is the motivation for them to contact us. And that suggests maybe they're not bothering with that. And that's why we haven't picked up a signal. So I'm going to suggest here the remaining four hours of this presentation, an alternative approach, right? Let's go for plan B. And that is forget about this signals. Don't look for radio waves, flashing lasers, any of that sort of thing. Look for artifacts. The universe, as you know, is three times older than the Earth, right? So there's been plenty of time for whatever intelligent beings might be out there to build really big stuff, to have really big engineering problems, uh, projects, right? I mean, infrastructure plans that dwarf ours, right? Because if they're 10 or 100 million years more advanced than we are, who's to say what they could build? So given that they could be doing that, you know, could we find that? Well, there are big advantages if, you, if that's what you look for. And uh, here are just a couple of them. To begin with, it does remove the synchronicity problem, right? Most SETI experiments look at a given direction on the sky, maybe a nearby star system like Proxima Centauri or what, whatever, uh, only for a few minutes. That's typical, two to three minutes, right? And so you have to hope that the Klingon's radio signal is arriving at your antenna during those two or three minutes. That's asking a lot, right? right? And uh, maybe asking too much. So by looking for artifacts rather than signals, the artifacts are just there. You don't have to time anything, right? Oh yeah, the artifact has to be there when you look. But you can look today or you can look tomorrow, you can like, look 10 years from now and the chances are the artifact's still there. So that removes the synchronicity problem. It also removes this problem, which at least some people think it's a problem, and that is, do we want to let the aliens know that we're here? Uh, <laughs> well, well, maybe what they do, and you know, Stephen Hawking made a comment about that, saying we shouldn't tell them, we shouldn't alert them with a signal that we're here, because who knows if they're friendly or not. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but a lot of people have taken this very seriously, I suspect, simply because it was said by Stephen Hawking, but he wasn't the first one to say it. And he only said two sentences worth. And uh, actually his, his, his daughter told me that she thought dad was a little wrong about this. I don't know if there's anything wrong, but, but I will say that if Hawking had told you his favorite delicatessen, you know, uh, everybody would flock to that delicatessen because of the recommendation from Stephen Hawking. But it does, it, to the extent that you think this is a problem, it's, uh, you know, there's no problem in looking for artifacts, right? Okay, so the aliens don't have to compromise themselves by sending out signals, revealing their presence. They just build stuff that eventually is visible. And they don't have to be alive now. This could be a homework assignment for some college kids. You know, go, go find the uh, Egyptian pharaohs who recently were in the news because they were moved from the old, <laughs> old Egyptian museum but anyhow, if you went to look for the pharaohs today, you would not find them. They're gone. But you would find these pointy buildings. And these tell you that there were pharaohs there. So this is a good evidence for pharaohs that doesn't require you to be very critical about when you look. Right. So it has that to be.
let me give you some examples of things because there are there are examples simply because it's a truism that every time you find something new in the skies which after all is the job of astronomers every time you find something new you don't understand it not at first sometimes but usually not and when you don't understand it there's always going to be some members of the community say aha it's aliens right and uh you know i mean i i think they should say that because after all that means you do check it out a little bit but it's never been true uh this was one of my thesis advisors this is martin schmidt took this photo at a party actually and uh he in fact was the first one to realize that what they had been photographing up there on palomar mountain in the mid 60s were entirely new kinds of uh, objects they they looked like stars but they were not stars so they were called quasi stars or quasars. That was 1967. And about two weeks after I got to uh, school, you know, he was already on the cover of Time magazine for the discovery of the quasars. But the Soviets, the Soviets had already suggested that because the quasars seemed to be varying in strength, you could hear them on the, with the radio telescope, you could hear the static and it was going up and down and up and down. And he said, you know, that's, that's not nature. That's, some alien civilization trying to get in touch. And the Americans immediately fought back and said, no, it's not true. The, the, the CTA 102, which was the quasar in question, it, it, it's not varying. Well, it turns out that uh, actually the Russians were right. It was varying, but it's a, a big black hole in the center of a galaxy and not aliens. But they did get the blame for a while. Uh, Pulsars, 1967, really not so long ago. Uh, this is uh, one of the, uh, uh, charts of the radio intensity from one of these quasars observed in the mid 60s at Cambridge. It's, it's not the Cambridge up the road from you guys, but the one in England. And you can see these pulses on the bottom, right? Very regular, about a one every second. And for a while, the people at Cambridge were calling them LGMs, little green men. They didn't know what they were. But when they found a second one, and then a third one rather quickly, uh, they realized, well, these are probably not aliens, because how do the aliens coordinate the kind of transmissions they're going to make over thousands, millions, really, of light years distance? Not millions, I take that back, but, but at least hundreds to thousands, because all the quasars, sorry, all the pulsars they were finding back then were, were in the galaxy. Okay, but again, aliens got the blame, or the credit, right, for something that nobody else understood for at least a year. And then Tommy Gold up at uh, Cornell kind of came up with a model for what, what the pulsars were. Okay. Here is something more recent, 2015. This was a, a result from the Kepler Space Telescope. And what's plotted here is just uh, the brightness of a star. There's the name of the star at the top, KIC 8462852. Uh, the brightness is a function of time. Now, that's not something that most people pay a lot of attention to. I mean, you can go out and look at the sun every day. You know, I don't recommend it. You only get to do it once. Uh, but, you know, you look at the sun and you look at the, the next day at the sun and it really hasn't changed very much in brightness, right? The, the changes are on the order of one part in 10,000. You get a bunch of uh, sunspots uh, on, the, on the surface of the sun and the brightness goes down a little bit, but not very much. Not 22%, as you see here for this uh, tabby star, as it's called, because there was a uh, postdoc at Yale, uh, Tabitha Boyajing, and uh, she pointed this out. So the question was, well, what is this? Well, a fellow at Penn State said, you know what this could be? Some aliens on a planet around that star have constructed a Dyson sphere around it, a big you know, enveloping structure that they would line the inside of which with uh, solar cells, and then they would do maybe radio the energy they collected that way back to their own uh, home planet, and they would have all the energy they could possibly use. Okay, well, that would be extremely interesting to find one of these things. But as it turns out, astronomers began to look at the uh, the, the star here when it, whenever it dipped in brightness, and they found that it got very red. And if it gets red, that's a that's an indication of dust. So it looks like. A uh, tabby star is a star that's, you know, orbited by a lot of dust clouds, whatever 
and not by a dice and seer or aliens. Once again, giving the credit to the aliens is the first thing everybody does. And there's this even more recent uh, example here. This is a Muamua, which was found with the Pan Stars telescope on Haleakala, I believe, in, in Hawaii. Uh, this was the first object, bigger than an atom, really, the first object found in our solar system that came from another solar system, right? We know that from the orbit. It's not a, a parabolic orbit, it's a hyperbolic orbit. So this thing, whatever it is, was from somebody else's solar system. We don't even know whose solar system. Now, this picture became very uh, well circulated, but this is an artist's impression, right? We only know from the changes in the light or the intensity of this object as seen in a telescope over time, it's, it's tumbling about several axes, uh, that it's longer than it is wide. That's about all we know about the shape. So all of this is a figment of somebody's imagination because, I mean, it is longer than it is wide, but all the rest of the detail is just made up. Okay, so this is the way people think of it. Now, uh, the chairman of the Harvard Astronomy Department, Avi Loeb, and you may have read about this, he made a point of this. He said, look, everybody's assuming that this is a, an asteroid from somebody else's solar system that happened to wander into ours. And he made several arguments for that, most of which are not terribly interesting, but one I thought was pretty neat. He says, otherwise, I mean, this thing was found after it had grounded the sun and was already on its way to the outer solar system, right? So you know, there was no way to catch up with it with a rocket or anything. None of our rockets would have been nearly fast enough. But it did come in within the, within the orbit of Venus, maybe the orbit of Mercury. I'm not quite sure I remember, but, you know, and then it handed back out. Well, what are the chances of that? I mean, if you just throw, you know, a, a tennis ball up into the air, are you going to hit that nickel you put on the sidewalk 50 feet away? You might, but the chances are you're not going to hit it, right? You just throw it up in the air by random or you know, in a random way. It's not going to hit a target like that. So how is it that this piece of rock could have come, you know, could have been thrown out of somebody else's solar system and just by chance came almost to the center of our solar system, right? And he figured that that wouldn't happen unless there were enormous numbers of these things. So you're throwing a lot of tennis balls. Well, Avi Loeb, you know, as I say, he's, he was chairman of the Harvard Astronomy Department longer than anybody else. He's a smart guy. And, uh, you know, when he talks, people listen. So he's made a real cow celeb out of this thing. And he has a book out now in which he also talks about uh, the fact that a Muamua is probably not uh, a rock or a dead asteroid or anything like that. It's just somebody else's hardware, right? It's a solar sail or it's a spacecraft. I mean, you know, that it's something that was deliberately built. And fortunately, he has the credibility to suggest that. He doesn't have to worry about tenure. He's got it. So now the, the people I know who study asteroids think that that's not, uh, kind of nonsense. They say, you know, if you look at the colors of this thing and this, that, and the other, it looks very much like an asteroid. But anyhow. You know, something to think about. Uh, and by the way, this story got a little less interesting when a couple of years ago, this uh, uh, Russian amateur astronomer, Borisov, uh, found another object that had a hyperbolic orbit. It was also from somebody else's solar system. And it's clearly a, you know, either an asteroid or a comet because it developed a, a tail, right? Here's a photograph of that. So maybe there are a gazillion tennis balls that are being thrown up in the air and some of them are gonna hit the nickel. Uh, this is another interesting target. I know that uh, this is getting tedious, but just wait till slide 806 and you'll find that interesting. Uh, this is called Breakthrough Listen Candidate 1. And uh, Breakthrough Listen is a project, a SETI project, by far the biggest one in the, on the planet now, financed by a fellow by the name of Yuri Milner. Yuri Milner uh, has made a lot of money in the stock market. He was an early investor in Facebook and, you know, high tech companies. He actually lives not terribly far from where I'm sitting here in the Silicon Valley. And he's very interested in these sorts of things. He, he studied physics. 
Um, so he uh, funded a 10-year project for $100 million that he gave to the University of California, Berkeley to ramp up their SETI efforts. And so they have. $100 million is a lot of money for SETI. It's more than it's ever had. And even when it was a NASA project. And so they were using an antenna down in the Southern Hemisphere, Parks Radio Telescope, which is about six hour drive west of Sydney, for those of you who've been to Australia. And they, they were pointing at Proximum Centauri, which I think is right down here, okay? And these are the Alpha Centauri stars. So Proxima Centauri is just a red dwarf star in the neighborhood there. It's probably a triple system. But they got a signal. And the question is, you know, was that ET? Well, it was at one spot on the radio dial, and it was narrow band, and it had drift, and all these things you would expect from a transmitter on a rotating planet. So this kind of made the news, but uh, they've been looking at it ever since, and they uh, analyzing the data, and you know, they're pretty certain that it's actually just terrestrial interference, which is too bad, too bad. But you know, got to look at these things. So where else could we look? Well, this is one place we could look. This is a view that you don't get too often in Rhode Island. This is the center of the galaxy, so the galactic center's in there. There's a giant black hole there to light, lighten up your day. And uh, the density of stars around there is about a million times higher than it is in our part of the galaxy. So, you know, maybe a really advanced society is willing to make the trip to the galactic center or send their machines to the galactic center and set up a beacon down there for the whole galaxy. All right, here's the morning weather report for the Milky Way galaxy or whatever they're going to broadcast. And so a lot of SETI experiments have spent time looking at the galactic center. The trouble is, of course, you need in general to be in the southern hemisphere to even see it, at least for, to see it for more than a couple hours a day. So that's a possibility. But let me just conclude with a little bit of speculation here because, you know, my, my colleagues don't really think terribly much about what the aliens might be like. They don't figure it's terribly relevant, right? If you can pick up a signal, it doesn't really matter whether they have, you know, <laughs> blonde hair or no hair or eyes like these, which don't have any whites, so you can't tell where they're looking, that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, they're, they're just interested in picking up the signal. But I think that it may be germane to consider what the aliens might be like, because I might tell you what they're doing and what you should be looking for. Now, here's a plot. This is an old plot now, 1997. Uh, from Hans Morovich, he's a uh, roboticist at Carnegie Mellon in lovely downtown Pittsburgh. And what he did here was he plotted the uh, amount of compute power you could buy, MIPS, per thousand dollars, right? And uh, those of you who are still conscious may notice that this, this plot goes up, right? You know that. There's something called Moore's Law, which is called really the lifeblood of the people that live around me here in the Silicon Valley. Moore's Law just says that at any given price point, say you spend $500 on your next computer, at any given price point, the compute power will double at that price point every 18 months, so say every two years. And that's, that's important because, you know, you buy a car and uh, winter comes and they throw salt in the roads there and, uh, you know, it rusts out your car. So you have to buy a new one fairly soon. But that's not true with computers. They don't rust out. You know, the, the beige cabinetry remains good forever. So, you know, the, the computer guys have to keep making the computers faster so the software will assume there's more power there and so forth. So your computer becomes a, a boat anchor after five years, something like that. Okay, well, it turns out that, uh, you know, this, so you can see that here, this is the exponential uh, rise in compute power at any given price point. Now, at, uh, in 1997, for $1,000, you could buy a, compute, a computer that had the, burnt, you know, the compute power of a lizard, right? But if you look at 2020, at 2020, depending on which of these extrapolations you find most believable, for $1,000, you can have the compute power of a human. It's not quite true, but there are computers around the world now that do have the compute power of a human brain, right? Human brain. Now, I think that this is important for SETI because... There's an important time scale argument here. Consider 1900, that's uh, Marconi over there uh, reading a ticker tape, <laughs> some Morse code being printed out. That was, you know, that was kind of the invention of practical radio, 1900. 
Well, in less than half a century, we had computers that were, you know, used by the Defense Department. They weren't small, took on an entire room and they were back into base. But we had the computer architecture that's used today in your laptop in 1945. That's very, very fast, you know, when you're talking about cosmic time scales. And maybe by the midpoint of this century, we will have what's called, you know, strong artificial intelligence or generalized artificial intelligence. In other words, a machine that is not, not only has the compute power of the human brain, but has the software to take advantage of it. I, I mean, today, if you spend a lot of money on a computer, you can get a, a, a computer that can beat anybody in the world at chess or poker or go, right? Okay, but you know, how interesting is that? But by 2050, that's the predictions I hear locally, uh, we have a computer, computer that can do anything cognitively that you can do, okay? In fact, I was up at the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab, I don't know, a couple of years ago now for some TV show. And uh, the guy who was in charge of the lab happened to be in the room while we were shooting this, this thing. And during a break, I went up and uh, asked him, I said, so are we going to have a computer by 2050 that can write the great American novel? And he looked up at me and he said, yes. And then he went back to sleep. Okay, well, maybe he's wrong. Maybe they're not going to do it by 2050. Maybe it takes till 2100 or 2150. Doesn't matter. Those are all the same time scales. The facts are as soon as you invent radio so that we could find you with a SETI experiment, within a century, two centuries, you've invented your successors. That's the most important thing we're going to be doing in this century, I think, is inventing generalized artificial intelligence. So there's a big question about how you keep that in check so it doesn't, you know, just turn you into a pet or something. But that's not the subject of this talk. What it is the subject of this talk is to point out to you that the intelligence out there, which you know we think must be there, isn't going to be one of these guys, right? It's going to be this guy. It's going to be some sort of machine. And since it's a machine, it doesn't care about things like uh, planets with oceans and atmospheres and all that biological stuff, right? So how could we find synthetic intelligence? Because synthetic intelligence to my mind, surely dominates the intelligence in the cosmos, in the universe. Biological intelligence is a, just a stepping stone to the real intelligence, which is something artificial. How can we find anything like that? Well, you, you, you got to ask, you know, what, what are their interests? What are they doing? I mean, they could be doing any of these things and just uh, entertaining themselves or doing other stuff. I mean, you know, maybe they just play free cell all day, but, <laughs> you know, they, they could play it very quickly. And I, I can't imagine that they wouldn't get bored doing that. Uh, they might be doing this. This is a somewhat more serious suggestion. This is Nick Bostrom. He's in the philosophy department at Oxford. And he points out that the, the rate of improvement in computers is so fast that within you know, a few decades, we'll, we'll be using them for simulations, not, not grand theft auto particularly, right? Or any of those simulation programs, but one that simulates life i mean simulates reality if you will and in fact he has been so bold as to suggest that there's a 20 percent chance that uh, the uh, the members of the skyscrapers actually are, are not real they're just a computer simulation running in a computer of the future i don't know how that will affect your plans for dinner but it's an interesting idea okay and maybe that's what all the computers are doing they're just simulating stuff Maybe, maybe, but there's this. This is the, you know, one of the deep field photos from Hubble. You all know that the universe is uh, slated for doom, right? It's all going to go away. Uh, ten to the thirteenth years, the last star will wink out, and in ten to the hundredth years, you know, the last big black hole will evaporate. And after that, it's just a cold, dark soup, and not much is happening. Although there's still quantum effects, and the quantum effects might you know, eventually, since you have infinite time, perhaps, will produce things that, uh, well, produce anything, including floating, you know, <laughs> floating brains in space, all that sort of thing. Now, that, that's a cosmological uh, or cosmology uh, question. But any intelligence in the universe will be well aware of the fact that our universe is not going to be around forever, right? And so maybe they do something to, uh, as a hedge against that. You know, they go beyond just figuring out how the universe is put together, but they're just going to modify it. 
this is a, an idea from a guy at uh, Dan Hooper. He's at uh, Fermi Labs in, in uh, Illinois. He says, look, you know, we got another 5 billion years or whatever it is of the sun's energy. And after that, it's going to get tough around here, right? And he said, so all societies will have that problem. And maybe what they do is before the universe expands too much, they get all the stars they can, the hot stars they can, and just keep them in a corral in the backyard and use them for energy purposes. I, th I think there's some problems with this, but let us not dwell on that. It was just an idea to give you somewhat of the flavor of the kind of things people think of, you know, where uh, an incredibly advanced intelligence considers what problems are really of importance to itself. Uh, another suggestion here, this is from Bob Zubrin, um, that, uh, you know, the aliens may construct their own black holes because you can get a lot of energy out of a black hole if you're careful about where you throw away your garbage. Well, okay, I think I've spoken enough. Uh, I'm going to simply say that, you know, we're looking. I bet everybody a cup of Starbucks will find something in the next 20 years. And uh, from your point of view, you can say, well, okay, uh, maybe they'll find something and maybe they won't. If they do, then at least I have something to talk to my spouse about during dinner. And if they don't, at least I get a cup of coffee. Well, thank you. Um, I'm aware that you're a little bit uh, time constrained. I, I unfortunately am, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. But uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time to share, share all of this with us.